Hi, just a follow-up to the mixed box of multimeters, and I mentioned that this U1273AX um, OLED uh, Agilent multimeter, none of that Keysight rubbish, um, was uh, faulty. Now, this is a, basically, I've never used it. It was brand new in the box. I do believe, like, it, it worked at one point, then went back in the box, and it just, next time I took it out, it just, it was dead. So I'm going to actually, um, I've put new batteries in this thing and um, we can like turn it on. It, it, it powers on, but we've got absolutely nothing on the screen at all. So the screen is dead. So clearly the process is working because it's going through some 1980s boot up cycle, uh, which is absolutely ridiculous. Like whoever approved that? Who at Lady uh, Agilent approved that? Come on, seriously? So let's get this bad boy apart. There's a serial number for those playing along at home. As I said, yeah, this just like, it was just sitting in the box. So I got no idea why this would have, would have died. I don't think it's ever been used in anger. Uh, why has this only got three screws? That's weird three and then hooks up the top is that it really no there's another one under there oh by the way this has had this could have something to do with it <laughs> but it's a long way from the screen this one did have there was battery leakage in it and attempt to stop the rot in there like it's not horrid right but obviously something's gone wrong with this one here and that could have leaked in through there and gone onto the board. So first thing we're going to look for is for, you know, it's it's not a huge amount of damage, but it's actually corroded this screw here. So there we, no, that screw doesn't want to come out. Okay. Yeah, this has got hooks on the top. Is that a spudger thing? Get the old, whoa. Yeah, okay. Well, there we go. And, whoa, yeah. See that screw? Oh, that screw. Oh, that's just cracked. That's just completely cracked. No, nah, it obviously, whoa, it, yeah, it does not like that at all. Wow. So that's crusty as, right? That's crusty burger. Check that out. Wow. But that's nowhere near the LCD, right? So, or maybe there's some, oh, yeah, it's, it's all, okay, well, that's all the crap that came out of it. All right. <laughs> you know, maybe, right? If you've had battery leakage and you've got a faulty product, then, well, you know, obviously you suspect the battery leakage, but that really doesn't look that horrific, does it? I mean, I'm not seeing a major issue with the board there. I mean, that's your, that, that's your battery contact. So, you know, clean up those. Stuff like the other pads, fine. But... Yeah, so there's some spillage on there, but not a not a huge deal. So Max 4611 there, and there's not many traces going to it. Analog switch, okay, it just has nothing going to it. So, um, well, there's not much there anyway. No worries. Um, let's keep looking. First thing, just a visual. So, well, it doesn't mean there's nothing like on the other side of that board, but I don't know, could be. Unlikely though, all looks pretty clean. And as I said, the uh, processor is clearly working because it's doing the <laughs> startup sound. Almost certainly sending um, stuff over to the LCD. AD637, there you go, that's the, uh, I know that one, that's the true RMS uh, converter chip. Before start probing around in here, maybe it's worth start, uh, maybe it's worth just flipping the board and stuff and having a look on the other side. I think that's worth it. Really, was that only a single screw? Or is it, no, it's just a, no, it's just a plastic clip. There you go, okay. Well, that was easy. Jeez, no wackers. All right, that's <laughs> the bottom of the, well, bottom of that down there, once again. Oh, yeah, the poster's, uh, poster's just completely gone. Really didn't like that. So it looks like the battery stuff just ate away the plastic. Um, as well, and uh, like it's not going to be anything wrong with the contacts because the contacts work, and that's not going to be an issue driving the LCD or whatnot. Why is that? Why do we have that serial number stuck there? I'm not sure what's doing there. I haven't I? Don't think I've torn down this meter before. 
it's not a problem. I'll check out the switch better. It's, it's hard to get it, like under the microscope here. It's better if you just do it visually or under my uh, mantis or something like that. It's all about lighting. You've got to get all the lighting at the right angle and whatnot. But um, no, nothing's nothing's happened. You know, like, no, there's, there's, there's no way. I don't think that battery stuff could have caused that. I think that's just a coinky dink. There's our OLED module. It's just a pin interface there. I wouldn't rule out just the OLED failing. So if the actual display itself is gone ski, then nothing under the rubby ba rubber baby buggy bumpers there either. See, so, you know, that's clean as a whistle, right? The contaminant didn't get down further. Now, of course, the problem with OLEDs is that uh, the A, they chew a lot of power. Um, <laughs> but they, they look gorgeous, of course, but they chew a lot of power. Do they last as long as LCDs? I don't think so. Well, there you go. Thre metal threaded inserts on there. Yeah, they're, they're soldered in. Everyone wants to see the processor. Show me the processor, Dave. 78F0547. So that's a uh, Renesis jobby. 595 to so the win. Thank you very much for uh, expansion. Some serial to parallel expansion there. Obviously boots and does its thing. And it's the OLED. That's dead. So... There it is, and flippity doo da voltage on here. Unfortunately, all the circuitry's under the bottom, and um, it's hard to probe <laughs> while the damn thing's powered up. Unfortunately, bloody Murphy, a 33063. There you go, 1.5 amp uh, peak boost buck uh, inverting switching regulator. So, fortunately, I can't measure that. But down here, we also have the... Uh, chip on flex down here this is the driver so this is the actual driver chip so it's just coming straight over here onto the driver chip uh that all looks good that's not any of that hot bar rubbish that's just proper solder so that's yeah they aren't uh, that's not the your adhesive uh conductive glue um down there so that's all soldered in so that's all rock solid i'd be measuring that power first unfortunately to do that i really have to solder on some like wires and get it out unless there's a pin coming back once again like i don't have a schematic we we have a part number in there we might be able to get something on that to see what uh, voltages and stuff it requires so i'll that's worth a shot well what do you know it's in 100, 108 us dollars <laughs> oh boy it's it's just a chipset basically it's a uh farnell data sheet oh 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 i saw a keysight multimeter there <laughs> 2.4 inch mono, uh, mono color, mono color OLED. Yeah, that's just the driver. Yeah, the driver I see is that. Okay, so that's the common driver I see. That's not the actual unit itself. There you go. You can buy the OLED. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. That, okay, so it's the same model that's used in the U1253, uh, which I've done a video on like way back, like in the first, you know, 30 videos of mine or something like that. Fob price, 60 bucks a piece. <laughs> Brett, that's Yankee bucks too. You have to be a bit desperate. And you've got to order minimum five pieces <laughs> for the OLED. <laughs> Just for the OLED. Oh, wow. <laughs> if I could get the multimeter for 60 bucks, I'd be buying five of those. You can bet your bottom dollar I'd be reselling those on eBay for a huge profit. So, okay, so that's the driver uh, chip. Okay, so VBAT, it needs 3.3 volts and it needs 2.7 volts for the digital. 190 microamps operating current, 550 microamps. That's pretty low. Oh no, here we go. <laughs> okay, normal mode current, 138 milliamps. You pay a hefty toll for your, for your fancy whiz-bang OLED uh, display there. Anyway, I'm just going to uh, clean up that board a little bit. Make sure that's all hunky-dory. And then I'm just going to repower this thing uh, back up. Because you never know, you know, could just be like a bad contact on the OLED um, on that uh, board to board interconnect or something like that, but no, still dead ski. Okay, so unfortunately, it's just really annoying to troubleshoot this because, as I said, I'm gonna have to solder some wires on there to actually measure it. And that other chip there is a C2P A51, it's obviously a linear reg there, so that's maybe for the local digital. Bloody black solder mask makes it hard to see. The inter we'll be using the internal switch as pin 2 
Well, pin two is not connected to the inductor there, which is rather interesting. Yeah, and pins one and eight aren't connected either. So it's not in the usual buck configuration. So yeah, the most annoying thing about troubleshooting this is that you have to put it back in the case in order to get the switch on there to get the power into the circuit and get it, you know, <laughs> fired up and doing the right thing. And then you've got to put the top on unless you solder um, like power wires onto there to power the thing and simulate the batteries. It's really annoying. And hopefully like these, and these wires then have to go out through the uh, blast wall over here, which has deep penetrators in it. So like I get trying to get these contacts onto here without damaging these, what like, oh God. Yeah, that just wasn't gonna work putting the case on. So I've just soldered uh, external power supply in here, six volts, uh, one amp, 19, 25 milliamps, 20 milliamps. So we got the, blah, 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 blah. right, so it's doing its thing. And um, by the way, little uh, pro tip, you can't see it here, but the cables that I've got running in here, uh, like this, um, you can't just have them dangling off the edge of the bench because then like the weight of the cables will actually pull these wires like straight off. <laughs> like So yeah, so I've got a little weight here on the uh, cables just, or you can stick them down to the bench just to make sure that these don't, you know, the weight of these leads just don't fly off the bench if you've got them uh, like hanging off the bench or whatever. So anyway, so I've got a ground here and so this is the switching converter. Okay, so we've got 7.7 .7 volts on that cap. So that's higher than the battery voltage. So that's a boost. Input, I think this is the input. Okay, 5.2, that sounds like an input voltage. Then this should be the output voltage of that regulator. You'd expect 3.3, 3.5. Okay, that seems to be precisely 3.5. So, okay, that seems fine. So I'm going to rule out that linear voltage uh, regulator there. There's no way it's going to fail. Like if it's a, meant to be a 3.3, it's not going to fail to like precisely 3.5. Obviously, you know, it's 99.9% .9 sure it's set precisely to 3.5 volts. That's a 3.5 linear reg. So 7.7 .7 volts um, on that uh, OLED, on that boost uh, converter there, that sounds reasonable. So if we go over to the data sheet for the SSD3303, uh, once again, this is just the driver chip, not the whole board. The whole board is a uh, Agilent Keysight uh, designed uh, board. But there you go, high supply voltage VCC, um, seven to 16 volts. So 7.7? should be working, like I don't know if that's what it was intended to be, maybe it was intended to be higher and it maybe has dropped a bit and it's a bit, it should, it's within the operational range, right? And that logic supply voltage there uh, can be as high as 3.5 volts. Um, that's its operational range. So they've set it to 3.5, okay, no worries. They're within the voltage range. And the connections, as you saw, to the OLED uh, display looked fine because they're not like an adhesive bond. They're properly soldered down. So it seems like um, it's an OLED failure. Um, let me go check if, if there's any history of this. Sure enough, EV blog forums got everything right. OLED slowly going bad and there's replacement uh, videos and Ian Scott Johnson has got a video down here. Um, coincidentally, um, <laughs> <laughs> this afternoon uh, or this evening, I'm actually doing an amp hour with um, Ian Scott Johnson. He's going to be on the amp hour, so check that out. I'm actually recording that tonight. So <laughs> what a coincidence. So yeah, he's done a video here. I haven't uh, haven't watched it, but um, yeah, it's. I think he's had the OLED fire. There's there's the oh, that's a different one. That's a, okay. So the oh, because this is the 1253. Okay, so they've updated it slightly, but physically it looks. Physically, it looks the same, but it looks like he's got a replacement one or he's, yeah, he's physically replacing the OLED um, strip. And there's another uh, video over here, Stuart Rogers. It looks like another repair. Yeah, that's, that's the board. There you go. So this is a thing, removing that. So yeah, it looks like you can buy the, uh, oh, it's stuck down too. Ah, oh, that's annoying. You got to heat it up to get it off. Um, anyway, it's, it's damaged anyway. So that's what it looks like uh, the problem is. I'm not even going to bother looking any further. In fact, I probably didn't even have to measure these voltages. Eh, it was fun anyway. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm just going to leave it now. I'm going to go order a new uh, OLED sp screen, see if I can get this uh, back working. It looks like, yeah, it's a thing. These things fail. Um, let us know in the comments down below if you've had one of these um, Keysight Agilent um, OLED multimeter fires. Um, it looks like a lot of people 
have and they've done repair videos on them. So there you go. Um, I could have found that out. I probably didn't even have to test it. I could have just went dead OLED, you know, 90% chance of it actually being the OLED screen. I could have just ordered one without even opening this puppy up if I actually did some research beforehand. And I'm back. I've got a screen, <laughs> got it delivered. Hopefully it's the right one, U1273. So um, if it's not the right one, then uh, apparently we'll get a bit shifted, like an, an inverse image, because the bit is bits are shifted or something like that. So you have to get the correct one, but ta-da, there it is. And here's the original. It's not a copy of it. It's a complete uh, like reverse engineered job. So here's the original and Here's the new one here. Look, oh, we've got a uh, got the programming header here. Yeah, it's got a micro in there. We'll have a look, but it uses a totally different look. This has got the chip on board over here. They've got a micro here, which is uh, programmed to like actually decode whatever you know bitstream that this requires for this to drive a di a completely different OLED screen. So let's go down in there and have a look. And uh, there we go, STM32. There you go, so all the STM... Somebody, I mean, this is such an issue, right? Is that there's so many meters that have failed that somebody um, it has gone to the effort, presumably in uh, China, to actually reverse engineer this screen here, like to reverse engineer the protocol and everything and the chipset or whatever, and drive, well, the protocol um, used to, you know, map the stuff onto the uh, screen and program a custom micro to drive whatever screen that is. So there's the uh, there's the code for the new screen. There it is there for those playing along at home. Um, so I don't know, I might overlay some data here for that one, but I won't check that now. But yeah, it's compatible and they've put in the programming header, nice. And they've got, of course, the, uh, the relevant uh, voltage drive. So um, <laughs> fingers crossed, let's actually plug it in and see if it works. <laughs> Because <laughs> apparently um, Ian Scott Johnson got his one. Um, he had one that was back to front, apparently. So, yeah, there we go. And since I've done the teardown, I've actually lost one of the screws. <laughs> lost one of the screws. Oops. I oh, won't. I've, I've taken the wires off. Everything's gone. I'm sure there's a plastic cover on there. Let me scrape that off. That would have been embarrassing if I left that cover on. And, oh, come on. You can do it. There we go. Beautiful. Like a bought one. Three screws will be enough, um, because yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't know, it's got to be on the bench here somewhere, or it might have fallen on the floor, it's probably on the carpet, can't forget our little, little, little speaker, so let's put that back on, no, that's not going to pinch, no, I think we're, we're going to be good to go, will it work, will it work? Oh, huh? Uh, do I not got all the batteries in? Is it not making... Oh! Whoa! Oh, something's not making... Uh, yeah. Oh, it's not... It works! It works! It works! <laughs> Look at that! Oh, it's like a bought one! Um, yeah, I've got to screw the case back together. Alright, so it is back together. And look at that, ah, oh, thing of beauty, joy forever. We're getting some uh, flicker on the uh, screen here, but that's only on the screen. I don't see that in real life. That's just the uh, camera frame rate there. Oh, look at that. <laughs> no worries. So that is one gorgeous looking screen, if it's a bit of a power hog, but uh, there you go. And I'm sure this thing works absolutely uh, fine because there's nothing there was nothing wrong with it. It was brand new, <laughs> basically brand new in the box, uh, never really used it, but the screen just died, as most of them in this, in, in uh, the, both the U1250 series and the 1270 series with the OLED screens, they all just die. So much so that there's a whole third party market of compatible screens. It's unbelievable. Now, this wasn't cheap. This cost me like 80 US dollars to get this replacement uh, screen module. You might be able to get a bit cheaper if you just get the uh, the actual, you know, you can, if you're lucky, you can uh, find one of the original uh, OLEDs and replace it, but then you might end up with the same problem because the failure is inside the OLED, whether or not it's inside the uh, cob or whether or not it's a physical manufacturing uh, thing inside, you know, all the magic uh, smoke escapes from the uh, OLED uh, in there and, yeah, it, it completely comes against her. So yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. I'd recommend the third party uh, board, which presumably uses a completely different um, OLED, which is not, well, <laughs> it's probably, hopefully, not susceptible to failure. But there you go, that is 
That is beautiful. You can, of course, get the um, LCD version, the U1272A, and these are these are excellent meters. They, you know, they're really good. Um, I'm surprised they're not more uh, popular. Actually, they're really incredibly feature packed. Don't you know, bang per buck, yeah, whatever. But you know, it's it's a pretty decent. Um, they're really good meters. They're super fast. They're super accurate. Well, I thought this video was done and dusted. Unfortunately, I discovered two uh, problems with this. One's minor, one's pretty major. The first one is, uh, you know how I mentioned the uh, reverse back to front display? Well, watch this. Works a treat, turn it off, turn it back on, boom, it's back to front. If you turn it off too quickly, it actually, it looks like it doesn't reset properly. Now I can leave it off for a few seconds. Hey, there you go. Yeah, yeah, we're good. And if you go into the setup, and the setup's just fine, right? It's got a comprehensive setup. You exit the setup, it resets itself. It's come a gutter. So there's obviously something to do with the reverse engineering of this particular uh, new uh, display in here that it's, it's like some power on resets not working properly. <laughs> the menu's back to front. Come on. It's hilarious. Anyway, yeah, it doesn't actually reverse itself. You just got to leave it off and then turn it on. So, yeah, oopsie, but minor, I guess you could live with that. Now, I only realized this after I actually uh, shot and edited and almost ready to release this video. I was bragging about how I was going to sell this um, on eBay starting at 99 cents. I was going to auction it off. But anyway, I was bragging that this thing was obviously going to be within spec because it was brand new in the box and the only thing wrong with it was the LCD and the uh, contaminant, battery contaminant hadn't gotten anywhere on there. So, you know, of course this thing's going to be bang on. This is like a high spec meter, right? I can put up the specs here. But look, Look, it's 1.1% out on DC volts. Are you kidding me? What the? Now, it turns out if you're on the low end of that, um, like the same range, okay, the same like uh, three volt range because this is a uh, 30,000 count full scale, then like it's pretty close. And if you go to millivolts, it's actually, you know, that's within spec. Okay, but why on volts if I change that to one volt, look, it's like, come on, no. And at full scale there, look at 3.04. You gotta be kidding me, this is totally out. So it looks like on both the three volt range and the 30 volt range, it is out, but it's not out on the millivolt range. So now I've got a bloody calibration, check this whole stupid meter. Unbelievable, bloody Murphy. And on my precision AC calibration standard, I've got it set to uh, one volt here and 1.01. So like one point nominal, 1.8% out. And just to show you that th that is bang on. This is a really schmick, um, <laughs> you know, a transfer uh, standard AC volt uh, standard. And you can see I got a 1272A here. It's bang on. So this one is out. Now, whether or not that, considering that it's both out by a similar amount on AC and DC volts, shows that possibly the uh, input voltage divider has drifted there. Now, of course, you don't need that divider when you're on the millivolt range. So the millivolt range is going to be bang on. So I reckon if I go to millivolt range here, if I change that to 100 millivolts, it does take time to settle. But there, um, like we're well, like well within spec, 99.94, .94, right? No worries. And this one here, let's go to millivolts. And yep, there you go. That's within spec, so that's fine. So it shows that possibly something's up with the voltage divider in this thing. Now, of course, we could go through the calibration procedure. I have checked. You can't actually get the service manual for this thing, but I, I don't know. Like, is it going to, like, drift, like, with time? Who knows? And once again, on uh, 10 volts, that is out. By 0.2, I'll go up to the 100 volt range and... We'll try that, because this thing can go up to a thousand volts, so it's pretty 1100 volts actually. Yep, it's, so all of those voltage ranges are out. So that indicates, yeah, it's a like a divider thing. I can't believe, like, there's a calibration adjustment problem in this meter. So we're back inside again, having another squiz, and this is where, you know, your visuals um, didn't really pick it up last time. But you remember how, obviously, the only leakage was around this part here. And uh, then, but now, with hindsight, right, this is, uh, this is the input AC uh, coupling cap. So let's not worry about that. But this pin here, 
this is the top side of the resistor divider, right? This is the resistor divider here. Here's the, the ceramic. And you can see it's, um, it's shielded here. So the ceramic, it's there, right? So we've got, you know, just like a shielding pad here, um, which you can see that with hindsight, there has actually been a bit of corrosion on there, right? Check it out. You can see that there. But that doesn't explain why we're out. The only reason we'd be out is if, like, there's extra load across this divider. There's some contamination under that mux, perhaps, that's causing some sort of issue. So, because this is how you get the different ranges. You get the different ranges from this resistive divider. And they put them on the ceramic. I've done a video on that um, showing the uh, like they laser trim because they're really stable and you can match them. And then they thermally, they've got really great thermal properties and matching. Um, so all of your ranges uh, match. So your good quality high precision meters are going to have a, cer a hybrid uh, ceramic resistor divider in them. And this one does. So obviously I reckon something has gone wrong. Like, there's no other reason for this meter to drift like that. Um, and did contamination get onto the onto the ceramic divider itself? I don't know. I'm going to have to desolder the shield to get in there and have a look. Ta-da! There we go. We've got that out. There you go. It's a top quality Caddick. Uh, no worries there, but, like, you can't get in there. It's, like, sealed. Like, it doesn't have a surface on it. Like, some of them have an external surface. This one doesn't. In quite a lot of them, you can actually see the, uh, like, the actual resistive elements actually patterned onto the carbon and then little laser um, trim marks and everything on there. But no, this is a fully sealed thing. So I don't see a problem. I, I, I can't imagine a problem within there. I'm guessing contamination somewhere else that's loading down the resistor divider. And if you don't fix that sort of problem, then yeah, I can recalibrate this and I'm sure it'll work fine for now. And then it could drift further. Yeah, I was looking to get in an ultrasonic bath and I'll well, throw it in an ultrasonic bath. It'll clean it. Yeah, I don't have one yet. So, well, I'm going to give it a thorough shellacking with some Ultrasolve uh, cleaning solvent, um, which, you know, a bit better than uh, isopropyl. I don't know, um, you know, can it penetrate under the chips and everything? Don't want to go like removing all the chips and everything else. So after a thorough spanking, nope, it's still out. So I've come back the next day, left it overnight, and look, it's a, it's a bit closer, so I think we're getting there. I think maybe we might have to uh, take a few things off the board or something. Hmm. Right, so back to here again. Now you've got to remember that uh, the impedances around here, your standard meter is like 10 mega ohms input impedance. So all the impedances around the uh, top side of the voltage divider here, they're very high. So it doesn't take much leakage at all on the top side of a resistor divider, leakage due to contamination under a uh, chip, you know, PCB uh, creepage and stuff, to be an issue. So they've removed the solder mask around here for a reason, right? Because this is a high impedance uh, part of uh, the top side of the uh, resistor divider here. Now, we've got this big ass series cap here, and that is the top part of your resistor divider here. So um, I'm inclined to take that cap off because that's, you know, like smack on where the uh, contamination actually came through. So yeah, I'm going to take that cap out. It'll function fine without that cap. It's just like a, a you know, an AC bypass uh, type thing. So as far as DC is concerned, we can take that off and uh, we should be, if the leakage goes away, then we know, aha, we've got it, right? And then we can measure that cap out of circuit. So even though this is in circuit, we should measure in the order of 10 meg there. And sure enough, there it is, right? 9.9. That might eventually go up to 10, so we might have another meg here, um, and it might be like a total of 11 meg input uh, impedance there. But yeah, so th that's across that cap. So and it doesn't take much leakage at all for that to become a problem. And of course, on the 200 millivolt range, it doesn't use a divider, or a 300 millivolt range. It doesn't use a divider. It doesn't use that divider. It basically bypasses it. So any contamination causing extra uh, parallel impedance there isn't gonna cause a problem, at least in terms of accuracy. It's just gonna slightly change your input impedance. And, uh, who cares? There we go. Now, of course, it's hard to tell, but you know, there could be 
there could be something there like you know you can see some paths there and the bottom side of that cap is well it's not terrific is it look at that huh i think I think we might have a bit of a culprit here. Yeah, like you can see, like there could be like a leakage path there. It's obviously had something, well, we know what. <laughs> it's the alkaline from the uh, battery is has been trapped under there. Yeah, you can just see it there, right? It's, <laughs> it's definitely leakage under that. So I'm going to, I'm going to give that um, clean again, and then we'll just run the meter. Because as I said, um, in DC volts, that cap's not going to matter. Now, as far as that cap's concerned we can attempt to measure that but we're not going to have any success i suspect because any contamination like it was just <laughs> dried out by the hot air that i removed this thing with can't remember the range of my national insurance meter here is it 100 meg so i'm going to clean up that uh cap and um we can just actually put that back in so i don't think it's damaged the actual ceramic of the cap, because you got to remember, the capacitance elements are um, inside there. So, you know, we should just be able to clean the outside and, you know, eh, it should be good to put back in. Aha, uh -huh, we haven't come back within spec yet, but, <laughs> well, it's on its way up. Yep, yep, I think we cracked it. Um, yeah, we've had contamination there. Like, I haven't uh, dried out the board properly uh, yet, but, yeah. That has solved it. You can see how that's clearly moved. We were, you know, 1% over 3 volts uh, before. And uh, the theory pans out that, you know, that high impedance um, side of the uh, input voltage divider. Uh, yeah, I think this thing is going to be absolutely fine once this uh, thing just dries out and we've cleared all the contamination. Because once the contamination is cleared, then we're back to where the original uh, factory calibration would have been. So, yeah, that's just slowly going to eke up. Um, yeah, we've just... <laughs> it just needs to dry out, that's all. But uh, we've confirmed it. Solder our freshly clean capacitor back on there. And I do believe we can declare that a winner, winner, chicken dinner. That is within spec. Um, once again, like it might dry out a little tad more, but yeah, anyway, shields back in place, the uh, capacitors back in place, uh, that uh, series resistor there um, in series with the cap, that was just a bead, uh, like in just an RF bead there. And look, um, absolutely fantastic. So yeah, no worries. I'm sure the AC will be spot on as well. <laughs> And of course it is. There you have it. Um, so yeah, it's basically bang on uh, to its original factory calibration. No issues whatsoever. So I'm going to give that a thumbs up. And if you like that repair video, please give it a thumbs up as well. Um, I don't even have to check the other ranges. It's just like, okay. And there you go, bang on at 100 volts as well, because, well, engineering works, right? <laughs> it's, you're talking about resistor, high impedance resistor divider ladders here, and if one uh, was out, then it's obviously that the other ranges that use that resistor divider would be out as well. And I've uh, checked some resistors as well, spot check, it's absolutely uh, fine. So it was just that high end leakage on the high end of the uh, resistor divider ladder there that did it. And whether or not, say, an ultrasonic clean would have got that out from under that cap, I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah, we just took it out, give it a bit of a clean, whack it back, no worries. Bob's your uncle. That is a repair video. So if you like that, please give it a big thumbs up. And as always, discuss down below. And I will actually um, put this on eBay starting at a 99 cent auction on the EV blog store. So go for it. Catch you next time. Hello.